I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh, thank you for the Manhattan Institute. I wanted to thank you all very, very much uh, for coming tonight. My name is Brian Anderson. I'm the editor of City Journal, and I'm very happy to welcome again to our city Theodore Dalrymple, AKA Anthony Daniels. Uh, Tony is the Dietrich Weissman Fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and he has been a contributing editor of City Journal for 17 remarkable years. I believe he's written more pieces for us than any other single writer formerly a psychiatrist at a prison in a public hospital in Birmingham, England. He now lives at least part of the year in France, where he devotes himself to writing. All of Tony's work is beautifully written, and in an era in which too much intellectual writing is impenetrable or poorly written, this is something truly to celebrate. But Tony is also a writer of astonishing range and profundity. Consider just some of the subjects he's tackled for City Journal over the last few years. The fiction of J.G. Ballard, the moral corruption of inflation, the British government's fiscal austerity program, the story of the PhD student in homicide studies who became a serial killer, <laughs> the, the oppressive architecture of Le Corbusier, and a theme he's pursued for many years in our pages and elsewhere, the moral breakdown of the welfare state in Britain a theme that proved him eerily prophetic when the UK was torn apart by horrific youth riots this past summer. As the riots raged, Tony's prescience was widely recognized. It is a Theodore Dalrymple moment, observed the Atlantic magazine. Now, I'm not sure that's a good or bad thing, but <laughs> the Wall Street Journal praised his intellectually bracing coverage of the riots. Uh, I don't think he was happy to be proved right. Now, Tony's the author of something like 15 books I've lost count, including three thick collections of City Journal essays. His most recent title in America, just out in paperback from Encounter Books, is The New Vichy Syndrome, Why a European Intellectuals Surrender to Barbarism. Tony also writes for the Wall Street Journal, National Review, The New Criterion, and many, many other publications. Now, in addition to warning about the breakdown of the social order in Britain, he's long been skeptical about the European Union's chances for survival, which could, I fear, make him prophetic again. So ladies and gentlemen, let me give you Theodore Dalrymple, Tony Daniels. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Brian. Um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to be here. Uh, the only thing that uh, Brian uh, 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 was mistaken about is that, of course, I would much prefer the world to fall apart than to be proved wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Let the heavens fall so long as I am proved right. Well, um, <clears throat> um, it's uh, very nice to be back in New York, though perhaps I should tell you that the last time I was here, uh, two days later, Lehman Brothers collapsed. <laughs> And uh, I went to Dublin, and uh, all the uh, uh, Irish banks collapsed. Uh, now, of course, I don't uh, attribute this. Uh, there's no causative relationship. Um, um, but uh, civil conflict seems to follow me wherever I go. Well, I think it's possibly I'm drawn to civil conflict. Well, some collapses are more sudden than others, of course, and one can experience the slower ones at one's leisure. And uh, to be in Europe is a little bit like being on the deck of an, a vast Titanic, which is uh, slowly uh, sinking while the band plays in an attempt to reassure the passengers that there's only a small hole <laughs> in it. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the iceberg that the European project, as it is called, has struck is reality. Now, of course, the uh, analogy with the Titanic isn't quite uh, 
imperfect because the Titanic was at least a tangible object, uh, whereas the European project is a bit more like the spiritualist ectoplasm, which is to say ethereal, uh, material, and bogus at the same time. Well, recently I was asked uh, by a hostile Bel Belgian journalist uh, in an interview uh, whether I believed in the European project. Um, and for people like her, uh, non-believers are suffering from something a bit like a psychiatric disorder, a form of mental illness or mental debility. Um, and perhaps, I don't know, DSM-5, you know, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, perhaps <laughs> it'll include Euroscepticism as a, <laughs> as a diagnosis. It includes virtually everything else. <laughs> um, so I replied that uh, <clears throat> I should answer her, I would answer her, if she would tell me what the European project actually was. And I'm afraid this was regarded uh, as the, uh, not the question of a gentleman. <laughs> and uh, no answer was forthcoming, and it very rarely is actually forthcoming. Um, now, Manuel Barroso, uh, who was the fiery Portuguese ex-Maoist, now turned international, um, international apparatchik, which course, is not that far removed, really, uh, and who is uh, the, uh, I always forget whether he's the president or the chairman of the European Commission or whether it makes any difference, actually. But um, he once let slip that the uh, project, the European project, was the, uh, uh, was the creation of an empire, uh, a kind of Austro-Hungarian empire, uh, Habsburg Empire without the Habsburgs, I suppose, or without the Gemütlichkeit. I certainly, personally, I would prefer, you know, I would prefer Franz Joseph to Barroso any time. But uh. <laughs> anyway, in this connection, I think it's worth examining the situation of the country of his colleague or sidekick, Hermann van Rompuy, who was uh, the chairman of the uh, uh, president of the European Commission. Now, Mr. Van Rompuy uh, makes a Sunday afternoon in Aberystwyth uh, seem dangerously exciting. Uh, I mean, he's, it must have taken years to develop such dullness. And, <laughs> <laughs> and when Nigel Farage, a British member of the European uh, Parliament, was told to apologize for having said that Mr. Van Rompuy had the appearance of a low-grade bank clerk. Mr. Farage promptly apologized to bank clerks. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, they're not, <laughs> they're not used to that kind of thing in the <laughs> European <laughs> Parliament. Anyway, Mr. Van Rompuy is um, a Belgian, and uh, Belgium is a country which has not had a central government, as you probably know, has not had a central government for more than 500 uh, days. And uh, some might think that this is taking limited government a little too far. Though I must tell you, as a, a, an occasional visitor to uh, Belgium, I find it difficult to tell the difference between Belgium with a government and Belgium without a government. Um, but the reason that uh, Belgium finds it uh, so difficult to form a government is instructive, uh, uh, and, and forgive me if I tell you everything that you already know about Belgium, um, <laughs> um, but uh, Belgium, the difficulty is that, of course, there are two uh, national, well, actually, there are three, but one is so small it's not important, two large national groups uh, living within its borders, uh, the French-speaking Wallonia, uh, Walloons, and the Dutch-speaking Flemish, and they've had 180 years together in Belgium uh, since the Treaty of London. But I should tell you that by far the most obvious border now in Europe is the border between Wallonia and Flanders. <laughs> because you go from Wallonia, where there's not a single word written in Dutch, to Wallonia three yards later, 
where there's not a single word written in French in a country that is officially bilingual. And this linguistic divide, which one could almost call a linguistic iron curtain, it is as strong as that, is compounded, of course, by history and economics. Historically, uh, Wallonia, the French-speaking part, was both economically and culturally uh, dominant, and uh, even the Flemish upper class uh, spoke f uh, French, and indeed, in, uh, until quite recently, uh, children were punished for speaking Dutch in schools in, in Flanders. But with the decline of the uh, coal and steel industries in Wallonia, and the rise of comparative Flemish economic dynamism, and that is actually considerable. Belgium is actually the largest exporter per capita in the world. Uh, the Dutch speakers have become far more confident, both culturally and e economically. But uh, they have taken on, uh, or it's been forced on them, large transfer payments between the two regions. Um, and Wallonia is now very much dependent upon uh, those transfer payments. So not surprisingly, the largest uh, Flemish political party uh, is nationalist in orientation, and the second largest is liberal in orientation, that is to say, believing much more in a free market and not believing in transfer payments. Whereas, uh, I think you can probably uh, guess what the main party in Wallonia is, it is the Wallonian Socialist Party, uh, which of course believes in transfer payments and possibly uh, bigger transfer, the biggest possible ones. And a large part of Wallonian life revolves around the distribution of the transfer payments. So it's actually like a political fiefdom. And since neither party has in, uh, no party has enough neither of the two main blocks, if you like, has enough power in Parliament to uh, form a majority. The result is political deadlock. And that wouldn't matter so much if it weren't for the fact that uh, it's imperatively necessary now for Belgium to reduce its government expenditure because it has quite, large, uh, quite a large budget deficit and it already is one of the most uh, publicly indebted countries in Europe, and therefore the world. Well, what is the conclusion that the Van Rumpies of the world draw from these uh, well-known facts? Well, first of all, of course, they think it's slightly vulgar uh, to draw attention to them at all. <laughs> and uh, if they had to reply, they would just say, well, you're a warmonger. And I can tell you that that is quite literally the kind of answer you get. So you believe in war then? I mean, there are several stages ahead in the argument. Um, and then they say, we haven't had a war uh, in Europe for 65 years. And for most of that uh, uh, 65 years, we've had a uh, European Union. Ergo, it's the European Union. Uh, that has prevented us from having a war. And then you say, well, before the war, we didn't have avocados either. <laughs> uh, well, the solution to the Belgian problem uh, in the minds of uh, Van Rompuy and others, of course, is to rope Estonia, Portugal, uh, Greece into Belgium and of course, uh, many others. Um, uh, because what will not work for two, two groups uh, over 100 and, uh, 180 years will obviously work for about 50 groups in three years. I mean, the logic is perfectly obvious. Well, this is an example of the astonishing capacity of members of the European elite to deny the most obvious uh, reality. And in its own way, this, this ability to deny uh, reality is, it reminds me of the, uh, the ability of the intellectual elite in, in, in uh, Europe and 
also in the United States, to, to ignore the reality of the Soviet Union in the 1920s and 30s. Well, perhaps intention in politics doesn't matter as much as effect, but what can scarcely be denied is that whatever its intentions, the European elite, of which Mr. Van Rompuy is both uh, the most typical and the finest flower, is um, <clears throat> steadily and quite quickly to dismantle representative democracy in Europe in favor of a system that for once could almost be called fascist, um, though not yet uh, brutally so. We don't yet have Mussolini, um, but we could yet have that. And at best, the system will be uh, technocratic, though of course it's important to remember that techno technocracy is not uh, synonymous with competence. And you can have the soul of a technocrat without having the skill of a technician. And in fact, the, uh, the, um, uh, the auguries are not too good because Mr. The, the chap who's in charge of Greece uh, was in charge of the central bank. Uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, and uh, Mario was, uh, Super Mario, uh, was at the European Commission. Um, well, Mrs. Merkel has suggested uh, that we need a genuinely functioning European Parliament. Anyone who has been to the European Parliament will know that it isn't really a Parliament. Uh, with powers to oversee the kind of fiscal union that is one of the preconditions of saving the euro. The other main precondition being uh, inflation. Um, but it's obvious that if uh, such a parliament were real, it could easily treat Germany as a milk cow with goodness knows what political consequences. Because Germany, although very powerful, uh, would not be able to control a genuinely uh, representative European parliament. So it would not solve the problem. In other words, the union can only work if it is opposed from above and is highly authoritarian and increasingly authoritarian. And I think we've already seen this. Uh, so while the, Europe, well, the trouble is that while the politicians in Europe talk European, they still have to act national because for the moment they are, are still, some of them, elected. And there's a complete disconnection and a dangerous disconnection between the reality and the rhetoric. And as anyone knows who's been to Europe, there's a complete disconnection between the political class and the rest of the population. And the situation of Germany is instructive and extremely alarming. Its population never wanted the euro, uh, but the political class went ahead with it anyway, irrespective of what the population quite clearly said it wanted or didn't want. However, it must be said that the euro did serve the interests of the German economy to a very large extent because the Germans were able and willing for internal political reasons to restrict their labor costs and their social overheads. Um, the, those have declined markedly there, whereas they have increased everywhere else. Uh, giving them an enormous competitive advantage. They had a com an advantage anyway. But they've done exactly the opposite of what most of the other European countries have done. So that their trade surplus is now equal uh, to much more than the trade deficits of France, Spain, and Italy uh, combined. And they used this surplus in part uh, to lend to the countries that are now in trouble. For example, uh, they, lent, um, they lent $150 billion uh, in Ireland alone. And um, uh, that amounts to approximately $40,000 per man, woman, and baby in, uh, in Ireland. So that... Uh, uh, the the uh, German banks have um, are in very serious trouble. 
But of course, quite a lot of that money uh, was actually used uh, to fund the, uh, the import by bankrupt countries from Germany. Now, the, the Germans are now faced with a dilemma. If they break up the Union, then quite a large part of their market disappears. Half of their surplus actually comes from European countries. Those countries will no longer be able to buy German goods. On the other hand, the, um, <coughs> uh, the Germans are not keen on the idea of inflation uh, for reasons, for historical reasons, which I don't... Uh, and actually, the rest of Europe is not very keen on German inflation either. <laughs> so although um, uh, they have been able to provide a BMW or a Mercedes for practically every car in Ireland, the situation doesn't look uh, very good. And uh, Mrs. Merkel is therefore faced with this terrible dilemma of whether to confiscate the German savings, and thus make all their sacrifices over the last few years, which have been quite considerable by comparison with, shall we say, the wonderful time that the Greeks and the uh, Irish had at their expense. Uh, it will make all those uh, sacrifices completely pointless, and the population will become very, um, very angry. Or there could be a real recession in Germany. And all this has been uh, brought about by the establishment of a currency that no one wanted in the first place. So this is an explosive political situation. And there is no solution. Mrs. Merkel, it isn't su surprising that Mrs. Merkel appears indecisive because she's being asked to square a circle in circumstances in which failure to do the impossible is, is potentially explosive. So if I had to uh, define the European project, I would propose as a working definition, and perhaps even a, as a mission statement, uh, the building of post-Tito Yugoslavia. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, I just ask uh, you to wait uh, until you get the microphone, and I'll field the questions. Uh, but please identify yourself since we're, we're on C-SPAN, um, and keep your questions as uh, you know, brief as possible. Wait, wait for the microphone. Uh, can the United States ex uh, escape the consequences of what will be the fate of Europe, economically speaking? Well, I think it will be quite difficult for the United States. I mean, if there's a downturn in, a uh, really serious downturn in Europe and collapse in Europe, I think it will be quite serious for the United States. It won't be as, it won't be as bad in the United States, but I don't see how it can have no effect at all here. Um, so... Uh, I, I wouldn't say that it, it can escape it altogether. I don't think, of course, it, it won't be as serious. Um, Tony, the, uh, there must be some voices uh, talking in this way in the press in Europe. It can't be just you and, and a few of us. Um, is, is there a growing recognition that the, the European Union is a, is a failed project? Um, among elites? Well, uh, certainly, f I mean, I follow the French press reasonably closely, and certainly now there are uh, widespread, fairly, fairly often uh, articles are printed by journalists who a few years ago would have been regarded as mentally ill in France, um, saying that the breakup is inevitable and it should be done sooner rather than later. As to the project itself, whatever it is, and I think it's the attempt to build a superpower, I think that's what it's all about, and 
uh, or, or not all about. I, I have a theory of the three, re the three things that, uh, the three motives for the, um, for the uh, European Union. The first is the Germans don't really want to be German anymore. Um, they want an alternative identity so that some Germans will actually say, if you ask them where they're from, they'll say from Europe, which no other European would say. So that is one thing. The French want to be important and powerful and know that they can't do it on their own and they would like to rope in particularly the Germans but others as well. And the third thing is that it's a kind of, you know, having gone into it, it's a kind of political Islam. It's easy to get into but it's not so easy to get out. And, um, <clears throat> and the advantages for the political class in Europe are so great uh, it's like a, a vast pension fund for, for retiring politicians or politicians who get fed up with having to be elected. And unfortunately, this is true of the whole of the European political class. So you have someone like Mr. Cameron, who's obviously uh, backpedaling. And this is the problem. It is a very corrupting thing. I think there are, of course, uh, people who are saying this more and more. Uh, but the grip of the, of the political classes in Europe is pretty strong still. We had a question at the back there. Please identify yourself. Tom Delzell, I'm in commercial real estate, Sperry Uh I watch the stock market go up periodically every time they announce some grand solution to the European problem. <laughs> and I, I think to myself that the traders must be in two classes, those that are dumb enough to believe it and those that sit there and let's ride this up and it'll crash in a week and we'll make money up and down. But I'd like to hear your thoughts about how our stock market reacts when every time there seems to be a, a grand solution. Well, I think uh, my, uh, <clears throat> my thoughts are obviously very similar to yours. And uh, the underlying problems are not going to go away. The uh, solutions are not solutions and their promises are not promises. Uh, I mean, nothing that these people say can, say can be believed. I mean, apart from it, if you take the, for the stability pact, the first people to break it were the Germans and the French. And um, so, uh, apart from the Greeks who never held to it in the first place, of course. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> uh, so I, I think, uh, and the problem is just an intractable one. They, they, of course, being politicians, want to find some some painless way out, and they, it can't be done. They painted them, and to change the analogy, it's like they the, the metaphor, they painted themselves into a corner and they don't know where to go. They can't go forward, they can't go back, they can't go sideways. And that's why they, you get these supposed solutions which uh, keep the whole thing going for another week and everyone breathes a sigh of relief until they realize that it's all nonsense and that the problem is still there. We have a question up front here. Hi, uh, Stan Town from New York. Uh, my question is uh, what uh, difference, uh, how different is this going to affect Eastern Europe and how different is this going to affect the United Kingdom if, uh, if it breaks up? <clears throat> well, uh, in the United Kingdom, we have our own way of, uh, of uh, destroying ourselves. And uh, in fact, uh, the United Kingdom is in the worst situation of any European country with the possible exception of Greece. It's by far the worst. It has, uh, it's, it's, it's got a very high uh, public debt. Its public debt has at least doubled in the last three years. And thanks to the manipulations of the great Mr. Gordon Brown, actually a lot of the debts have been hidden. Uh, so that's the first thing. We have a huge trade deficit. And we have no domestic savings. So this, uh, and, uh, and we, and not only do we not have domestic savings, we have the highest level of private indebtedness in the world, practically with, with the exception of Ireland. Uh, so there's, there is no good news about the, uh, uh, the, um, the United Kingdom, except that it is not in the euro. And I, uh, people ask me, does that count in Gordon Brown's favor? And I say no, because he made so many decisions that it's not statistically possible for him 
to get all of them wrong. Um, so, uh, and of course, uh, Eastern Europe is going, I mean, it's largest, by overwhelmingly its largest market is in, East, in, in, uh, in, uh, um, in Western Europe, but since they're so used to hardship, it'll probably actually affect them uh, less, e uh, less than in countries which have much larger transfer payments. When you have transfer payments, and people wholly dependent on transfer payments, and then you find yourself in the position where you have to withdraw those transfer payments, as we either nominally or, or actually, um, then, um, then there's going to be social trouble. I recently went to Middlesbrough, and uh, Middlesbrough is um, in the northeast, and actually the centre was once grand in that municipal Victorian grand style, um, but it was quite clear that, uh, I mean, years ago it was a, a, an industrial powerhouse of, of shipbuilding and um, uh, steel and uh, coal uh, and so on. And now it is quite clear that the major industry is state-subsidized takeaway pizza. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> Middlesbrough is... Uh, the Soviet Union uh, with fast food. <laughs> and uh, and uh, actually, it's, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's astonishing. And then qu quite a large part of Britain is like that. I was in Clanetley, and it's exactly the same in South Wales. And the, the, real, the, the, the real incomes of these people is just going to have to disappear. And uh, it's going to be very, very unpleasant. And that, incidentally, is going to happen in Wallonia, too. Uh, and it's going to happen in France and, and everywhere else. So while it's easy to establish these transfer payments, it's very difficult. And I don't want to sound um, uh, grad grindian or, or about it. I mean, it's going to be awful for those people. And it's not going to be their fault about how, how awful. I mean, it's something that we have done. And unfortunately, our political leaders, for example, the Conservatives, have done no intellectual groundwork or no, uh, no groundwork in informing the population that this is, the pro this is going to be a big problem. So it's, I, I think it will be much worse in Western Europe than in Eastern Europe. Let's go way, way back. Uh, get a question from the back of the room. Thanks, Brian. It's uh, Ovik Roy from the Manhattan Institute. Tony, the, the Eurosceptic posture is a populist posture. It critiques the, the elites, the Herman Van Rompuys, the technocrats in Brussels who are engaging in various self-satisfactory quests of aggrandizement at the expense of the interests of the people they theoretically serve. Yet, is it really true that uh, a friend of liberty, the classical liberal who is also a Eurosceptic, can count on democracy as his friend? Isn't it also true that, in fact, in the European welfare state, that uh, it's actually quite difficult to reform those systems using uh, the democratic appeal, the populist appeal, uh, in, 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 a, in a more market-oriented direction? Isn't it true that, in fact, the Eurosceptics, in order to achieve their goals, will need to be just as technocratic and elitist as the people they oppose? I, I don't think that's quite true. What is true is that it'll be very difficult for the reasons that the uh, Swedish Social Democrats understood a long time ago. They, said they knew that once you had a sufficient percentage of the population that was dependent in one way or another on the government, then you didn't necessarily, you didn't need to have a one-party state in order to have a one-policy state. And that's, in its essence, what uh, we have. And, of course, we have a, a high, very high level of corporatism in Britain and elsewhere, where it's increasingly difficult to tell the difference between private enterprise and... Uh, uh, and uh, and, and public, uh, public service, as it were. So, of course, it is very difficult. I mean, in, in Britain, uh, f I think it's now 52% of the 
of the GDP is uh, government activity of one kind or another, and 50% of the population is in receipt of some kind of direct subsidy uh, from the government uh, of one kind or another. And not only that, but we've changed the ambitions of young people. Young people now want to go into the public service because it's seen as the only way of, of having any form of security. Uh, and enormous privileges have been granted, in the, especially in the last 10 years, to huge numbers of people who will have pensions that people who work in the private sector can only uh, dream about. So I agree with you wholeheartedly that it's very difficult, and I have flirted with the idea of constitutional uh, change, uh, because un uh, unless we do something, we're on a giant ship that is just headed for the rocks. And um, so I agree with you, it's extremely difficult. Uh, but it's even more difficult because no one, re no politician ever tries to make the case, at least in Britain. Um, and that's disastrous. Um, up here with a, a Debbie, um, right there, yes. Uh, I believe um, Europe accounts for about 20% of the U.S. exports. What percentage of of Asia's exports relates to Europe as much? I, I couldn't give you the figures, but I know that the European Union is China's biggest customer. So it's important for China as well. And if it's important for China, it's important for the whole world. Um, so, and it would not be surprising if other countries were, because despite everything, of course, Europe is the largest trading area in the world. So I don't think the I don't think the Asians will be looking on with joy uh, on all this. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. Uh, let me go to the back of the room, then move to the front. Uh, back, back here. Uh, Saul Stern, City Journal. Uh, there's even more reason to be uh, pessimistic than you indicated, because you didn't you didn't discuss the factor of, and I'd love to hear more from you on it. Uh, astonishing uh, decline in Europe's birth rate. There's just not going to be enough young people to support old people in, in the next three well, decades. Yeah. Well, of course, in Spain, they have far too, although they have a very low birth rate, they already have far too many uh, young people to support because 46% of them are unemployed. <laughs> um, however, I, uh, as someone who has now almost reached old age, uh, I don't feel yet I'm ready to give up work. And I'm slightly less worried than a lot of people are about that because I think uh, the nature of aging has changed quite a lot. So, and I, I mean, you can just see, I mean, it's perfectly obvious. If you look at photographs of people who were 40 and 50, uh, say 50 years ago, they look 60 or 70, even 70. So, I mean, we're all going to have to work for much longer. Uh, but I think we'll be able to work for much longer. Um, so I, I'm slightly less worried about that than some people. However, the, the, thing, about, the thing that worries me most about the demographic uh, collapse, if that's what you want to call it, is what it indicates about people's um, view of life what's important in life. That's much more important. And people have really given up having children, I think, partly because they find them just an inconvenience. And they get in the way of their holidays in Bali. <laughs> and it's, it, it's a terrible society in which that can be the case. All right, we have time for maybe uh, two more questions um, up here. And then we'll move to the front. Paul Interst from uh, Mount Vernon. Uh, the title of your speech was The Roots of the European Crisis. And I've heard you say the euro was imposed on Europeans and they didn't want it. That's part of it for sure. But isn't there more? Isn't there supranational organizations without proper controls of mixing currencies with different history of inflation, like very careful Germans and very profligate uh, French and Italians? 
Uh, yes, that's absolutely right. And uh, uh, I was asked actually by the Belgian journalist uh, uh, who, um, who thought I wasn't a gentleman. Um, <coughs> uh, I was asked next whether I thought that nationalism was a danger. And I said that I thought, of course, some kinds of nationalism are very dangerous, but supranationalism in our current circumstances is a bigger danger. Partly, of course, because it's going to provoke the very kind of worst nationalism uh, that it's supposed to be the answer to. So, of course, the supranationalism, the danger of supranationalism is that no one really feels it. As I said, people have to act national, but they speak, uh, they speak international or supranational. So yes, I mean that is uh, uh, at a uh, uh, one of the roots of the of the problem. I agree. Uh, Tyler Beebe, um, as we know, five or I think six governments have already toppled. Uh, in the EU due to this mess. Are you totally dismissing the possibility that the new Mario Montes, if you want to categorize them as being uh, of that ilk, uh, cannot force austerity on their resistant populations to the extent that they maybe can turn this super tanker towards uh, the right direction? Well, I think there's one interesting counterexample, um, and that is Ireland. Uh, actually, Ireland has done uh, very well, uh, and it's the only country in Europe so far that's been able to deal with this in what one might call a, um, a mature way. And I go to Ireland quite often, and, in, and, and it's very impressive. Uh, they threw out, uh, they threw out uh, the government w of the dominant pl the political party that's been dominant since independence. Uh, that got the smallest share of the vote that it's ever got. So it was the biggest, the most crushing. Defeat, um, but they accepted the necessity. The population has accepted the um, uh, the necessity for austerity. And I have friends, for example, I have a friend who is a doctor who works in the government system, and uh, she has accepted without any fuss at all a, a decrease in her salary of twenty five percent. And uh, many, many people in Ireland have accepted it. And there's been no social unrest about it whatsoever. And the reason for this, and I think this is quite impressive, and is completely different from Greece. Um, I mean, it's, it's not for nothing that countries are different countries, you know, uh, is that the Irish population accepts some of the responsibility for what actually happened. It knows that the bankers Absolutely. I mean, the, the head of the uh, the head of the Anglo-Irish Bank was uh, called the uh, worst banker in the world, which was probably true at a time when there was quite a lot of competition. <laughs> um, so the banks were no good. The government benefited enormously because it uh, the the problem there was private um, uh, private borrowing. Uh, uh, and uh, and there was an absolutely mad uh, property bubble. I think they built something like one new house for every uh, six people. And since Ireland uh, was not a place of homeless people to begin with, uh, this wasn't a terribly good idea. And you can go through Ireland and see all these ghost houses and everything, uh, ghost estates. But the government benefited. And one thing that I did learn on, uh, from this experience is that uh, a balanced budget is not in itself a sign of, automatically a sign of health. Because all through this uh, period, the, in fact, they had a budget uh, in excess. They had more money coming into the government than they were spending, even though they made the Irish, at the same time, they increased the Irish public service and made it the best paid in the world. Um, but all within a budget, a balanced budget. So it appeared all right. But of course, the ultimate source of the money was taxation on transactions which were themselves from the bubble, which itself was caused by the 
uh, borrowing and so on. But the Irish population recognizes that it was completely, it was involved in all this. It was borrowing money enormously to buy uh, large parts of Bulgaria and, um, and all over the world it was buying large, it went absolutely mad. And because they recognized that they were involved, the government has been able to uh, to impose a great deal of austerity. And the government also did one very good thing in the face of a great deal of pressure from the European Union. It kept its company taxes low. It was, they were trying to, the, uh, this is a very interesting thing, I'm sorry if I'm going on. But uh, the, the, uh, the French accused the Irish of having predatory taxes. And the, pred the predation was failing to tax. <laughs> uh, and fortunately for the Irish, they were able to resist the pressure to, I mean, that really would have sunk them. So that is very impressive. But you can't have that. I mean, for I think for cultural reasons and historical reasons, the same thing, which obviously, I mean, the, the origin is all slightly different in Greece. You're not going to have a population that's going to accept austerity in the same spirit as in Ireland. So, I mean, I think uh, although we talk of Europe as if it's one thing, it isn't one thing. The, the, the things are slightly different. Uh, well, I, I mean, yes, they're ingenious enough to do it. It will not be done honestly. <laughs> We, one more question, if we've got time for it. Or do you want to ex expand on that? No, no, I don't think I need to. <laughs> okay, uh, right up here over on the side, Debbie. And that's the final question. Thank you. John, John Schmidt, Common Sense Institute, New Jersey. Uh, the new big solution that's being offered is to get the ECB to function as a Federal Reserve yes. to begin buying up all these bonds. Can you comment on where that's going to lead? Well, I think in the end it'll lead to an enormous amount of social unrest and violence because the only way that can be done is by having a virtual German occupation of the whole of Europe with the Germans telling every country what to do. And already there's a great deal of resentment in Greece, as we know. I mean, the Germans are portrayed as Nazis in the... Uh, in, in, in uh, Greece, and uh, the Italians are actually uh, becoming uh, very anti-German now. Uh, in Ireland, there's a lot. They just call they just call Europe now. They call it Germany, and they call the the people who come in all Europeans who come in from the central bank and all that. They're just called Germans. <laughs> they don't bother with uh, distinctions. And I think that, uh, I mean, it's inevitable if we're going to have uh, European bonds. Uh, and if that happens, uh, then I think there are a possibility of explosions all over, all over Europe. Uh, it's, not, I don't, it's not inevitable. I haven't got any uh, powers of, um, real powers of prophecy. But I think that's a distinct possibility because they're going to say, you must do this. You must uh, cut this, cut that, and, and so on. And we don't care what the economic effects in your country or social effects of the country. You must do it. And they'll be forced to do it. And then we can already see what's happened in Greece. Thank you very, very much, Tony. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. Theodore Dalrymple, Anthony Daniels. Uh, we appreciate all of your support and interest. Thank you. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.